Hello everyone, uh, welcome to my session, Kubernetes cost optimization, how to actually do it. Uh, very much a welcome um, and let's dive right into it. So before every session, I like to kind of go through what value do you get by attending this talk, this session, um, kind of just like going through the learning goals. And I think it, with this session, the learning goals are very clear. So it's to learn best practices for cost optimization. Uh, so that's the goal for today. Learn a few best practices, learn some tooling that you can use, and in general, just kind of get some new tips and tricks on how to get started and continue um, on your path to cost optimization um, as well. So who am I and why am I speaking about these kind of things here today? So I'm Annie uh, Talasto. I'm a senior product marketing manager at Camunda. Uh, I'm also a CNCF ambassador as well as an Azure MVP. I've been a Kubernetes and CNCF meetup co-organizer for many years now. I also coach early stage startups as well as I co-host and produce the Cloud Cossip podcast that you can find at cloudcossip.net as well. So overall, I'm very much a Kubernetes and cloud native tech enthusiast and specialist. So very excited to be talking to you about these topics today. But let's dive right into it. So why does cost optimization matter is the first question that we will be answering today. Um, so on a personal and a kind of company level, it obviously matters because everyone probably has been in the situation where they received cloud um, bills and invoices. And also in this way, they've also probably been in the situation where you receive an invoice or bill that's a bit higher or way higher than what you anticipated originally. And it's obviously not the best feeling to be in at when you receive that surprisingly large bill. And I think in the big picture, why cost optimization matters nowadays, particularly um, even more than in the past, is that uh, when you, when cloud was in such a um, big thing back in the day, as well as now that we are adopting cloud more and more, um, uh, if you were you know running your um, environment in a, in a physical environment, you had you had to order physical servers, you had to manage all of these things, you would obviously over provision the resources that you need quite heavily. Because if you would have to order more physical servers to catch up with the demand of your application, um, obviously that's not a good place to be at if you are lacking compute power. So over provisioning was a norm rather than, than the exception. And obviously it makes sense in that context. But then nowadays, since we are in the cloud, it makes flexible scaling possible and it has introduced a, a lot of new services to use as well. So we are using even more cloud resources and even more compute resources than we ever have in the past, as well as then our cloud bills are starting to get bigger, but we can also have the flexibility to manage those cloud bills and optimize our clusters and our environment quite a lot easier and better. Um, and you know, this is um, a really great thing in my opinion, where we can actually have more fine tuning into our uh, infrastructure as well in this way. So why, if this is the situation, if, if everything is, is kind of set in place for cost optimization to be a big thing, why, why is it then so complex and why is it then hard to, hard to manage? Well, in here you see a snapshot of a bit of view of the kind of, um, cloud bill, um, or cloud, um, instance prices and VM prices. So it does get quite a lot of confusing. There's multiple different categories. There's a lot of different things to consider. Definitely not the easiest task to do in a way. Uh, and just, you know, in Kubernetes specific, you might be wondering how many machines or nodes do you need and what size should they be? How many pods or containers do you need and how big they should be? Sequential, there's a lot of questions in the air when you're thinking about these things. And also, even if you were to find out kind of like the, the best case scenario for all of these things, the application requirements do change quite a lot. So uh, you have a different amount of users, you have all of these things. So you don't have to just think about these during deployment, you think about these things constantly, which makes it even more complex. So it is difficult, um, but not impossible, of course. 
and also the um, the kind of the usage of the resources is relatively inbuilt into there. So half of the Kubernetes applications utilize less than 30% of the CPU resources, and this is according to Datadog 2020. Um, not even a survey, it's kind of just a look into what's actually happening within the clusters. So it's, they utilize quite a lot less, less re CPU resources than they could be, which means that a lot of this kind of uh, cloud waste is inbuilt into the services already as well. Um, so that's making it even more complex. Uh, and now this session won't be a kind of deep dive into how does cloud pricing work, but let's just set the scene a bit and discuss how does it work uh, in a very um, superficial level. So you have multiple different categories that you can kind of kind of use. So you have the on-demand instances or VMs, and, and it, this is a, in uh, the pay-to-go, pay-as-you-go model, which is kind of the most familiar model for, for cloud usage. Um, so for example, AWS charges you for every hour of compute capacity used by your team. Um, and then you face no long-term binding contracts or upfront, upfront payments. You are, you are not over committing any budget, but you just have to watch carefully your usage at all times. It is also the most expensive option, so overrunning your budget is a real risk here. It is flexible, but then again, the pricing is gonna be higher. And then you have reserved instances, uh, which is also then um, saving plans and whatnot in AWS as well. So. Um, Azure and AWS, for example, have a very similar pricing schemes, even though there are obviously differences. So in this, you, uh, these you buy capacity upfront in a given availability zone for a really low price when compared to the on-demand instances. And the larger the upfront payment, the bigger the discount. Uh, and the commitments are usually like one to two years. Mm, and this is obviously sometimes a bit difficult, like you get a good discount but you have to be committed in, to a specific instance or family, uh, and then changing it later isn't really an option. So this could be an option, this could be an issue if your, if your requirements change later. Mm, and then, in, for example, in AWS, the savings plan is similar to reserved instances, but you're committing to using a given amount of compute power over the one to three year period. So uh, it, there's a small differences there, but still, you know, relatively same across all the major cloud providers. Mm. Then spot instances or spot VMs, they are a very cost-effective pricing model. So you bid on resources that CSPs aren't using at the moment and you get to save up to 90% on the on-demand pricing. But it comes with a limit, limited availability, so the cloud provider can pull the plug with a two-minute warning as well. So uh, Azure or Google give you a Google Cloud give you a 30 second warning. So it is relatively fast. So you can kind of get offloaded pretty easy. You can handle these things, uh, but you just need to know what you're doing, obviously. And then there's also a dedicated host, which is a physical server with an instance capacity that's exclusively for you. So you can use your own license, licenses or cost reductions, but still get resiliency and flexibility. Um, so it's a good choice for businesses if there's a lot of compliance and governance needs that are really demanded from the cloud usage. So this is how the pricing works on a very high level, like a quick guide into this. And then how to forecast cloud cost then, because before, uh, now we know that, okay, these are the ways to, to, to the bill is built and then how to then forecast it because truly to optimize and to manage your cost, you have to forecast and you have to have visibility into here because the cloud bills can fluctuate quite a lot and it's worth your time understanding there for sure. Um, so there are three techniques that you can use so you can analyze your usage reports. So um, you need to achieve a clear visibility of your cloud expenses. So monitor the resources usage reports regularly. So you can use uh, email and other alerts to keep your bill in check, check. And then you can model your cloud expenses. So how do you calculate the total cost of ownership of your cloud resources? Um, so you can start by analyzing the pricing models and plan capacity requirements over time to forecast the cost. It's also really smart to measure application or workload specific costs to develop an application level cost plan um, as well. Mm. Then you have detect peak resource usage scenarios. So you should use periodic analytics and run reports of your usage data to identify these scenarios. 
So you can use other data sources, for example, the seasonal customer demand patterns. If you spot these patterns correlate with your peak resource usage, you can now identify them in advance. I would have imagined that, for example, if you are running a um, business that depends on the seasons, on how many people are using these services, that obviously impacts a lot on your peak usages, for example, during the time of the day or which season is it and so forth. Uh, but overall, uh, the cost optimization scene can get a bit confusing. There's so many options that you can do uh, from, you know, kind of just general good DevOps practices from structuring your resources, setting budgets, allocation, review and repeat, goal setting, you know, from using uh, all of these things, using multi-cloud, all of these things uh, can be considered really good cost optimization practices, but it can get also really overwhelming. So not just on top of, you know, using understanding our cloud, build native cost management tools, policies, and all of these things. How do you actually decide on what are the best practices to focus on in the beginning and how to get the most out of these things? Obviously, if you manage your the resources really well, you're already on a good path to being cost optimized. But then I will now present you with eight best practices for cost optimization that are kind of like the highlights that people usually uh, have, get the biggest and the best impact out of from. So let's get started on this list. So eight best practices for cost optimization. The first one being define your requirements. So you should only order what your workload needs across all compute uh, dimensions, CPU count and architecture, memory, storage and network. So even if an affordable instance might look tempting, but what happens if you start running a memory intensive application and you end up with performance issues affecting your brand and your customers? So you really should pay attention when choosing between CPU and GPU dense instances. And if you're developing a ma machine learning application, for example, you probably need a GPU dense instance type because training models on it is much faster as well. And then uh, the second one is choose the right instance types. Um, there's so many to choose from. So there's really no denying that compute resources are the biggest line item on your bill. So picking the right VM instances type can save you even 50% of your cloud bill. And cloud providers offer many different instance types matching a wide range of use cases with entirely different combinations of CPU, memory storage, and networking capacity as well. So um, every type comes with one or more sizes and you can scale your resources easily. But do you have to consider though that cloud providers roll out different computers for their VMs and chips in those computers have different performance characteristics? So you might pick an instance type with a strong performance that you actually don't even need and you don't even know it. So understanding and calculating all of this is hard because there's so many types of different instance types. Uh, you can do a test on yourself, but there is really good handy guides online as well where these have been tested out as well. Um, so the third one is very verify storage transfer limitations. So data storage is another cost optimization aspect for it, your time for sure. So each application out there comes with unique storage needs. Make sure that the VM you pick has the storage throughout what your workloads need. And also avoid expensive drive options like premium SSD unless you're planning to use them to the fullest. Um, and then fourth is check if your workload is spot ready. I have a few spot instance and spot VM related here. So I think it's three all together uh, within these eight practices because they are a really good way to optimize for your cost. But before you start using them, um, you have to uh, decide on how aggressive you're going to be about implementing them and what will be your strategy. So here are a few things that, that you should consider. How much time does your workload need to finish the job? Is it mission and time critical? Can it handle interruptions? And is it tightly coupled between instance nodes? And what tools are you going to use to move your workload when AWS or some other cloud provider, Azure, GPC, and whatnot, uh, post block? Then the second spot instance or spot VM tip is when choosing spot instances, pick the slightly less popular instances because they're less likely to get interrupted. And once you pick an instance, check its frequency of interruption at the rate of with the instance reclaimed capacity during the trailing month. Uh, you can use the uh, service advisors, for example, Azure Advisor, AWS Spot Instance Advisor, to see different information on this. For example, um, AWS Spot Instance Advisor has ranges from under 5, 5 to 10, 10 to 15, 15 to 20, and, and so forth, to really see uh, what the ranges are. 
and don't shy away from using spot instances for more important workloads. Some cloud providers offer some type of spot instance that, that gives you an uninterrupted time guarantee for up to six hours. So you can just pay a little, pay a little more for it and still achieve a discount of 30 to 50% on the on-demand pricing as well. And then when you are bidding your price on the spot, the rule of thumb is set the maximum price to the one that equals the on-demand price. So you never uh, end up at least, you don't end up in the biggest risk, which is getting your workloads interrupted once the price goes higher uh, than the, what you set. Uh, then to, to, to boost your chances of snatching spot instances, you can set up a groups of spot instances, for example, in AWS called AWS Spot Fleets and reference multiple instance times at the same time. You will be paying uh, the maximum price per hour for the entire fleet rather than the specific spot pool. Uh, but to make it work, you're facing a huge amount of um, configuration setup and maintenance task as well. So it is a bit of work. And then you can use mixed instances. And this is a completely Kubernetes exclusive tactic. Um, so mixed instance strategy gets you great availability and performance at a reasonable cost. You basically pick different instance types since some of them are cheaper and just are good enough, but might not be suitable for high throughout with low latency workloads. So depending on your workloads, you can often pick the cheapest machines and make it all work. Uh, so once you, or you could have a smaller number of machines with higher specs, and this can really help slash your bill because each node requires Kubernetes to be installed and adds a little overhead as well. Um, but mixed instances present some scaling challenges as well. So in a mixed instance scenario, each instance uses a different type of resource. While you can scale up the instances in your auto scaling groups using metrics like CPU and network utilization, you will get inconsistent metrics. So cluster auto scaler helps heal by allowing you to mix instance types in node groups. However, your instances must have the same capacity in terms of CPU and memory. And the last uh, but not the least is make multiple regions work for you. So instances spanning across several availability zones increase your availability. Um, and it is then, you know, recommended to configure multiple node groups, scope each of them to a single cloud region, automate your deployment and take advantage of price fluctuations and price fluctuations between regions as well. So these are the eight, eight, eight best practices of the cost optimization that I'm, I've told you today. Uh, I will give you resources on where to find uh, uh, these uh, in a written down format as well. So no need to worry if you miss some parts of this as well. But then I think it's worth exploring also what is actually holding teams back from adopting these. Because if all of this information is available, if everyone could be doing this, what are some other tooling, trips, and tricks that you can actually do to supercharge your cost optimization journey? Because that takes a lot of manual work. So the um, FinOps Foundation, which is under Linux Foundation, it's a foundation looking into exactly these kind of issues. So they do a report um, where they look into, okay, what are the issues teams are facing adopting FinOps and cloud cost, cost optimization practices and what are the issues facing teams? Um, so what are the challenges that do FinOps teams face? So 39% says getting engineers to take action, 33% dealing with shared costs, 30, 26 said accurate forecasting and 24 reducing waste or unused resources. So 39% said getting engineers to take action. So it's also uh, it's a tooling issue as well as a culture issue as well, I can see. Mm. But then usually if, if you can get, um, if you can make it easier for the engineers to take action, tooling might be a good way to do that because if it kind of cuts some, cuts up, cuts some out some of these manual steps you have to take, it might help with your adoption. So what tools are then FinOps practitioners using actually? 26% use native tools to cloud providers, 4% uh, use third-party vendor plat platforms, and then 32% use spreadsheets. So spreadsheets are obviously very good and very kind of uh, trialed and tested out approach here. But I do think that if um, teams and, and um, engineers and users can use tooling that it's a bit easier to use these things so you don't have to do so much manual work. I think that the, the taking the action part would be easier. And also here I think it's worth noting that nearly half of the respondents say that they have little to no automation. So I think automation tooling could be a really great solution to a lot of the issues that these teams are facing. Um, but luckily there's a lot of tooling and resources that one can do. So you have CNCF project solutions that one can use. For example, you can use 
Um, so all of these help with cost management or other visibility into your cluster. So event-driven auto scaling, I will do a quick demo of that next, which is Keda. You can use Helm to, to better manage your applications. Um, and for example, with Helm, if you, if you are uh, able to adopt new services faster and then you're also able to update and delete the services that you are either up in need of update or need of deleting, you're also managing your cost very well because you don't have any um, use kind of useless or um, legacy applications or anything in running in your cluster. Uh, monitoring is obviously incredibly important to get visibility into your cluster, so Prometheus is great for that. Flux is great for container workflow, and having a service mesh is incredibly important uh, because that gives you access to a lot of great things, for example, to um, having access to the golden metrics and whatnot, and Linkerd and Kuma are great C and CF projects to use here. Linkerd being a great graduated project, so very much recommended for production. And Meshery, if you are in a situation where you have multiple service meshes needed to run, so they support multi-mesh management on that side. Well, then, if we take a closer look at Keda next, um, to learn a bit about how we can use that for cost management. So what is Keda actually? Uh, so as default Kubernetes scaling is not really well suited for event-driven applications, Kubernetes is more for resource-based scaling, so CPU and memory. Um, so this is where Keda comes in. Keda is event-driven scale controlling that can run inside any Kubernetes cluster so that it can monitor the rate of events to preemptively act before a CPU is even affected. So this is where the magic is. And you can install it into new or existing clusters, and you can use extensible and pluggable scalers to grab metrics from multiple sources as well. So what are the Keda principles then, or what are, how is Keda built? Uh, the principles are not to rebuild anything that Kubernetes offers out of the box. It's single purpose, simple, and non-intrusive, and it works with any container and any workload. So we're going to now go through a quick Keda demo, which is scaling .NET Core Worker with Azure Service Bus. In here you see the demo um, application architecture. It's very abstract in this image. You only have the order processor, order queue, and so forth. But in this case, you can already imagine that it could be a web shop. So if you're running a web shop that, you know, um, that sells different items and you have a period of time when there's going to be a lot of demand, a lot of orders will come in. Um, then you need to scale up really fast and scale down when that order kind of a busyness rush hour ends, you can then kind of get uh, downgrading your resources as well. So let's go to the demo. Uh, let's open up here. Let's open up all of the different terminals so that we can have visibility. Um, and then let's get to my notes. Perfect. So in here we see the terminals that I have opened here. So if we go to, we're gonna, gonna have a bit of visibility needed into our cluster because the uh, demo itself will be very fast. So we're gonna now open up a lot of things that we can see what's gonna happen within that. So we need an external IP to see the order queue and we will see then the orders coming in. So here is Keda samples order portal. Thank you so much to the Keda team by, for, the, for the demo by the way. And then you have the order queue length, you have the number of messages and everything there that we will see the action then kicking on soon. And then we will do kubectl get deployments namespace keta.net to the blue terminal. So in there we see then oh, how many order processors do we have ready and when we're gonna start scaling them up, we will actually see more of them getting ready. And then to get a bit more visibility to the history in the cluster. So kubectl get bots to the black terminal that I have here. Um, and then we see there what's the status. So we will there see the creation of the order processes. So we are all kind of ready as far as visibility goes. So when we go .NET run project uh, here, we will see it's gonna ask us soon about some things. How many orders do we want to kind of kick in there? Let's give it a moment to get started. Uh, let's see. It's not super fast at the moment, but let's see uh, how well it will go. Did I time this time something? Let's see. There we go. You know, demo effect always getting to you. 
So let's queue some orders. How many do you want? So we want 100 orders and this demo is going to go very fast after I click yes, hopefully. <laughs> there was some demo effect there on the air already. Um, but then we're going to see what's going to happen to the order queue length and we're going to see how many new order processors we are going to get and so forth. So let's get started. So we need 100 of these queuing order hat for uh, for here and then we have fish, hat, shelves, keyboard, chair, pizza, a lot of different orders coming in here. And then we have the order queue rising up. It's rising up very fast. It's getting at the 150. It's getting to... 100 eventually and then we will should see the auto scaling kicking up so there we go order processors are one out of one uh, ready and then we see that there is container creating and then there's they're pending on the new order processors and then we are at 100 and then everything is happening at the same time so we are brought up four out of four order processors we are still at pending pending and then we are container creating we need more order processors and now we're worth 100 so now we're starting to handle a lot of those orders so the order queue is starting to go down Mm. So there we just go from pending and continue creating to running and then we are at 8 out of 8 as far as the ready order processors and now we are already at 150 so we are handling those orders very well. Uh, we are managing them efficiently. We are there, we're going up, we're going down, 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 all very nicely and so forth. So that's amazing to see. So now we see that okay we are at 10 out of 10, we have order, we have the order queues empty, we have uh, manage them all and now eventually Kea will start downscaling the cluster as well uh, the order processors so then it will start stop using the resources when we don't need them so all in all what like kind of happened here was that we had a influx of demand and we had zero processors we raised the orders to the order queue and the Kada automatically spun up enough order processor instances to handle all of those orders and then very importantly Kada will have after processing the orders will then auto scale the processors down so this was event driven auto scaling in practice so why is this great for cost optimization then well exactly because of the auto scaling up and auto scaling down so at any point in time here you are not wasting any resources so you don't have a system where you have you know over provisioned and you're just kind of wasting resources when there is no actual need to have those resources up and running you're only using them when you actually need them at that time and as a, as a fun fact that's also obviously really good for managing your uh, natural resources as well so you are not wasting any cloud resources in general either which is really great and powerful in general as well so we it takes about five minutes in this demo um for for Kados to start um auto downscaling the 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 order processor so we're not going to wait for that we're going to move on with our presentation and talk about some other things while we while we see if that will work but it's it's gonna just it will just say terminating and terminating here and then this would go back to the, to the situation that we had already here so ready zero out of zero so it's not quite as exciting and fast paced as this uh, beginning part of the demo. So let's get back down to the slides. So um, there is no, now we have gone through um, eight best practices. We have gone through cost optimization, general things. Now we've gone to, we, I can give you some examples of what CNCF projects you could use. And now we went through a deep dive of, well, deep-ish dive of Kata. And then um, there is also obviously a lot of great vendor solutions to use as well. So if you are in the lookout for commercial solutions and you have the budget to pay for them, these are really great ones that you can use. So there's Castia, there's Stormfort, there's Spot.io, KubeCost and many others as well. So KubeCost, for example, is really great and powerful for visibility and cost reporting in general. They have really good features there um, and I highly recommend using them for that as well. And then if you want more of an automated um, platform that automates your use of Kubernetes and, um, and your cost optimization, so you have Castia, Stormfort and Spot.io and many others probably as well. I'm just giving you a few examples. So for example, if you use Cast AI, which is a Kubernetes native cost optimization automation tool, it you would just have to plug in your cluster, you have to give it some read-only writes first, and then you get a savings report where you can see, okay, how much you could be saving. And then if you plug in the automation, um, you will then get all of these things that I was mentioning before um, automated for you. 
So instead of you know managing these manually, the the, um, the service will check if the instances are spot ready, how to manage them, optimize them, and so forth. And um, Stormforge and Spot IO do very similar things as well. Um, so these are some of their vendor resources that you can look at. So we went through why cost optimization matters and how cloud bills and all of these things works. Then we went through eight best practices to get you started on this journey. Then we went through CNCF projects to leverage that you can uh, for open source tooling. And then we took a little bit of a closer look at Kata. And then we went through some vendor solutions that you can utilize as well. And um, here is some learn more resources as well. So you, the FinOps Foundation has really a great uh, resources. So you have principles on how to do your cost optimization. There's book recommendations. A lot of things, if you're interested in these topics, you can just kind of get lost into the FinOps Foundation uh, materials and just deep dive there. The, um, I wrote for, I did a speech um, at the Kong event as well about this topic. And on the basis of that, there was a blog post called Eight Best Practices to Reduce Kubernetes Cost for the Kong blog. Um, so if you want to learn a bit more about the, the same best practices that I had there, you can check that out. If you are more of a beginner to the cloud native world, I highly check them, recommend checking out Tech World with Nana. Nana, they have a really great resources into both the beginners and more ad advanced people, but uh, there's a really great videos there. And CNCF YouTube has a lot of great content as well. For example, the KubeCon North America 2021. Uh, videos have been published so highly recommend checking them out there you will learn a lot there as well for example my speech about how to use event driven or how to use event driven auto scaling so kata as well to um, combat climate change with the same demo actually the demo that i that that was um, used in kubecon as well um, you can see it there in the CNCF YouTube as well. So highly recommend checking that out. And as always, uh, I will add the slides and all the links to GitHub. So you can find them in there if you are in need of these later. Uh, and all in all, thank you so much for listening. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. Um, I love Kubernetes topics. I love talking with people about Kubernetes topics. So if you have any questions later, or you can always read out, reach out to me, for example, in Twitter or LinkedIn. Very happy um, to, to see you there. And if you want to hear, hear more about cloud native and Kubernetes tech news, I'll be uh, both tweeting and retweeting a lot on them. So give me a follow on Twitter if these things are of interest to you. And last but definitely not the least, I want to thank you all the organizers. Uh, a great conference and event we have going on here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for attending this session. And um, so, so much. Uh, great things are happening um, in this space. So thank you so much for attending and see you next time.